Thank you very much for joining us for tonight's event as part of Victorian Law Week. As we gather for this event, the College of Law and Annika Legal would like to acknowledge all of the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are attending this event. We pay our deep respects to each of their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, my name is Marco Novikov. I work for the College of Law. The College of Law provides practical and professional training to lawyers and law students alike. So if there's anyone in our audience today that's either a law student or a lawyer, and you wanna learn a little bit more information about the College of Law, you can um, find the wealth of that on our website, and you can also follow us on our social media channels. Now, of course, the focus of today's presentation is on our community of renters in Victoria. And the topic tonight is rental rights, repairs, and refunds. Now, all of the hard work that's gone into preparing this presentation and its delivery, it's all come from Annika Legal. And the College of Law is very lucky to have a strong relationship with Annika Legal, and we've partnered with them for this very important initiative. So joining me tonight from Annika Legal are Lucy and Zoe. Now, Zoe will be your presenter today, but Anna, Lucy will be available to answer any questions as well. Now, that's pretty much it for me. I'm a renter myself, so I'm really keen and excited to listen and follow through um, and learn more about my rental rights. Zoe, I think this might be a good time to pass on the floor to you. Great. Thank you so much for the excellent introduction, Marco. And hello, everyone. Really excited to have you all join us. And thank you so much to the College of Law as well for partnering with us um, and supporting us with uh, delivering this webinar. Um, so we've got an hour together. I'm really excited. Um, we have tried to make this presentation an interactive one using a tool called Slido. So in order to um, engage with our um, questions and things like that, you will need access to either a smartphone device or some kind of device like an iPad or something, um, or you can use an extra browser um, on your computer if you're joining us from your computer and you'll be able to interact with us through that as well. So get that started if you are around. Um, so yeah, so today we'll be talking about rental rights, repairs and refunds. Um, but before we get started and kind of to give you all an opportunity to start using Slider and kind of get yourself, you know, warmed up. Um, here's the QR code. You can use the QR code to join us on Slido, or if you type in slido.com, you can use that code to join us from a browser. So I'm going to give everyone a little bit of time to get that sorted. And then I'm going to ask you the very first question, which is, have you ever heard of Annika before? Um, and I just, while we're waiting for the answers to come in, I just saw um, the question about closed captioning. Unfortunately, the Zoom gods have not been kind to us despite um, our best efforts working with Zoom. Um, we won't be able to provide closed captioning in this particular um, webinar, but what we will do is uh, we are recording this webinar at the moment. Afterwards, we'll be able to feed it through another program, um, get some captioning on that and share the link to that as well. Um, so we will follow up after the webinar in relation to that. Now, I'm having a look at, oops, going back to that. Sorry, I closed the question accidentally. Uh, we can still wait for more uh, responses to come in, but from what I'm seeing so far, we've got a bit of a 50-50 split, so that's cool. Um, in any case, we're gonna move ahead. Hopefully you've gotten more kind of aware of how Slido works, which will put you in good stead in the future um, for the rest of this webinar when I'm asking you questions about rent, um, rental rights. Um, but I'll just give you a really quick rundown of what Annika is in case you haven't heard of us before. Um, we are a free legal service. We help Victorian renters through free and personalized online case support. So those are the things that are important to us as we continue to grow our services. Um, we really believe that it's important for every client to have a bit of human touch as they're getting legal support. So for all our clients, as they're going through um, our cases, they don't just speak with the lawyer, but they also get matched with their own paralegal who can keep in touch with them throughout the case. Um, at the moment, we're offering three services. So we've got one relating to repairs, where we're helping renters get repairs done so that they can stay in the homes. Um, we've got a second one in relation to evictions where the reason for the attempted eviction 
is in relation to arrears and we can try and help renters negotiate a payment plan with a rental provider. And our third and newest one is bond negotiation. So again, um, for matters, bond matters that are currently at VCAT, um, we can try and intervene while the renter is waiting for the hearing to see if there's any opportunity to negotiate with the rental provider and get a resolution. So that's just a little, little bit about Annika. Um, and this is just a little bit of a disclaimer about today's session. So um, what we are providing today is legal information only. It's not legal advice. Um, it's not going to be the comprehensive information of everything in the Residential Tenancies Act because it's a very long act and we only have one hour, but instead we're going to deal with, you know, core concepts underlying those rights and duties so that you have a little bit more context as you navigate any rental issues you may come up with. Um, as I said, we will we'll be using interactiv interactivity features, um, but rest assured all your responses are anonymous. Um, so if that's a concern for you, please feel free to interact with us. We can't figure out who it is that is giving us those responses. Um, and if you do have any questions as we go, please feel free to pop it into Q&A. There's also a Q&A feature on Slido. We might not get enough time to get to question time. We'll see how we go. But even if we don't get to question time at the end, um, we'll still be able to review all the questions that we receive throughout the webinar. And if there's any common questions that keep coming up, we can also include that in like a short info sheet or something like that um, after the webinar when we follow up with you post-webinar. So another question, um, how long have you been renting? The reason I want to ask this is just because um, I want to get a sense of who is in the virtual room with us and what the experiences that you have had with renting has been like so far um, in your life. If you've just joined us, you can interact with Slido by either scanning the QR code using your device, or you can put in slido.com in your another browser window and type in that code to answer the questions. So I can see we're getting an increasing amount of interactivity as compared to the last um, question. So that's really great to see as you guys are all kind of like settling in. Um, I can see, yeah, we've got kind of like an even split between people who've been kind of newly renting, but renting for a few years, up to five years. Um, and then quite a few people having rented over 10 years as well. Although that's just taken the lead. Um, I think it's really interesting, interesting to see this because as we know, the number of renters in Australia and in Victoria are increasingly on the rise. Um, housing affordability is absolutely a huge issue at the moment leading up to this weekend. Um, and I can see we're probably like maybe slowing down to the end of that, but we can see, yeah, a lot of people in this webinar have been renting for over 10 years. It's certainly not, you know, a short term kind of Thing. It's something that a lot of people will be doing for a long period of time. And for that reason, it's really important that everyone knows what their rights are, but also engages with the system well so that um, we understand, you know, what are the real needs out there and how can we make the system work better for a substantial amounts of Victorians and Australians. So moving on to the next question. This one's really cool. I'm really interested, interested to see what will happen. If you go to your device or your browser, just use one word to describe any disputes you have had with your rental provider before. It can be how you felt. And by the way, you can put in like multiple words. Um, you, can, you can see some words coming up. And by the way, if someone else puts in the same word as you, that word just gets like bigger. So it'd be really interesting if we give this like 20, 30 seconds to see kind of what kind of word cloud we come out with. Um, in addition to the feelings that you might have had, I'd also really be interested to know, like, what was the dispute about? Was it about bond, repairs, access, other things? We can see frustrating is getting really, really big. Um, I'm actually not surprised about that at all. Um, well, as we continue on with this exercise, I think we can give it a little bit more time because I really want to get, like, a like huge work word cloud. I think it's interesting. Um, you know what? What what went wrong? Like, are there un, any other words other than feelings and what it was about? But like, what made it frustrating? Was it the contact? Did they refused to do what you asked them to do. Did they simply were, just did not respond to you? Um, 
I think we might have come to the end of that. I'll give it like a few more seconds. And while we're waiting, I'll just have a look at the chat. I can see someone's put in liars to the chat. Um, I assume that was for the word cloud. Um, so we can also include that in there. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to read through this for a moment. So this honesty about them moving into property, that kind of like replicates, you know, liar. Oh, okay. It just changed. Frustrating, bond, unreasonable. Very big. Okay, that like definitely slaps me in the face. Gaslighting, that's a really terrible situation to be in. Um, it's never nice to go through that. Be cat, nightmare, unfair. Um, I mean, obviously I asked this question in a very general kind of neutral way. It could have been, you know, we could have gone the other way. It could have been like, it was great, happy, you know. But it's very interesting to see that like across the board, we can see that there's a lot of frustration and kind of negative feelings and negative experiences coming through. Um, so hopefully in this webinar, we'll be able to um, give you some information about rights and duties, help you understand a little bit more about what you are entitled to and what you can do when things go wrong. And hopefully in the future, um, fewer of these, you know, um, feelings would come through if I were to ask you this a year from now, um, because it certainly it does help um, to have tools at your disposal to kind of hold the other party to account to their duties and things like that. So just a quick summary of what we will cover today. So mainly there will be three parts and I kind of really wanted to present it in a way where I'm taking you on a journey through kind of what happens during the rental agreement. So if we think about like a story as like a start, middle and finish, um, I wanted to group kind of the main issues that we might see in those buckets. Um, and hopefully as you're going through a journey like that in the future, as you enter a new rental agreement, these are the risks and things that, you know, you'll be like, oh, I'm entering a tenancy, what, what, what should I look out for? Oh, right, this is what happens at the start. This is what happens in the middle. This is what happens at the end and things like that. Um, so those three parts are when you're starting your tenancy, you want to know what your main rental rights are under the agreement. So we're going to go through that. We're going to look for what to, what explicitly to look out for when you're entering into a rental agreement and understanding of all those stack of agreements that, or sorry, stack of documents you get when you're starting a rental agreement, which of those documents are the most important and what specifically within those documents you should be looking out for so that it enables you to protect your rights from the very start. Then we're gonna to move to the second part of the presentation where we're gonna talk about what happens during the tenancy. And often a lot of disputes when you're in a tenancy arises from disputes about repairs. So we're going to go over the rights and duties of the rental provider as against the landlord, um, what you should do when things go wrong and the options that you can take to try and you know, put things back in the position you need them to be. And then at the very end of the webinar, we're going to talk about what happens when you're leaving a tenancy. And ultimately, um, you know, very commonly, the most common type of disputes that people get when they're leaving a tenancy is unsurprisingly um, disputes about the bond. So we're going to talk about what bonds are, um, steps you can take to minimize a bond claim, and what to do if your landlord does want to take your bond. So like I said, all of these will just be a brief summary only. It's a lot of topics to get through an hour, but um, we're certainly going to try. Um, before I delve into the thick of it, I'm just going to quickly check the chat. Oops, sorry, I've got a very sensitive mouse. Um, yep, all good, cool. Thank you for being on top of it, Lucy. <laughs> cool, so rental rights. What do we look out for at the very start? So hopefully this is a, you know, happy time for people when they have to enter into a new place. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of things to look out for in the future. Um, but for others, it may also be, you know, a very critical time when they're needing to move out of the previous property into a new property. And there may be a, you know, a number of financial and other life pressures on you. It can be really hard to understand which of the information, which of the vast amounts of information that you're getting, you need to concentrate on. Uh, so, at the outset, I wanted to talk about kind of like the general kind of core concepts of what a rental agreement is. Um, and of course, a rental agreement is a contract like any other contract, but because of how common they are in society, rental agreements specifically are lifted out um, and are governed by, governed by the Residential Tenancies Act um, to make sure that there are really clear um, protections around what people can expect from a rental agreement. 
at its very, very, very core, like any other contract, it's just about one party giving something to another party in exchange for something else that that party gives back, right? So the most basic concepts in rental agreement is you give rent in exchange, you get to live in a property. Um, so that's the kind of how the rights and duties between the renter and the landlord um, interacts. But if we delve down kind of one level deeper, you can see that a lot of the duties and rights that you have as a renter also correspond with similar rights and duties that the landlord has. And it's really important to know kind of how they interact with each other, because often when you enter into a dispute um, and you kind of start conflating all these rights and duties, that's when it, it can get really, really confusing. So if we delve down kind of like one level deeper, you can see I've kind of put three dot points under each of those columns. And I did that on purpose. So each of those dot points in terms of the leveling correspond with each other. So on the renter side, if we go to the very, very left, um, you give money to the landlord, right? But you don't just give money of whatever amount at whatever time. You have to pay a spe specified amount of rent um, at a specified time. And in, in exchange um, for that, what you get back is the possession. And then correspondingly, the landlord receives the rent. So they have like a right to receive the rent, but in exchange, they have to give you privacy. Um, if we go kind of the next level down um, in terms of like the quality of the property and what it looks like, um, et cetera, um, as a renter, you do have a duty to look after the property, um, which extends to, you know, just cleaning your place um, to like a requisite level of cleanliness and minor maintenance and things like that. But correspondingly, the landlord also has a duty to keep the property in good repairs. Um, and the way that these two kind of rights and duties on either side correspond with each other can be really hard to, you know, navigate sometimes because there are certainly landlords out there who kind of just assume that all damage, no matter whether or not it was caused over time or whatever, is the, um, the renter's duty to maintain. Um, and not understanding the delineation or having the words to put that boundary down between the landlord can really, you know, cause renters a lot of frustration. And then very lastly, um, the other kind of core concept in a rental agreement is, of course, when you enter into that rental agreement, you have certainty that you will have a place to live if you carry out your duties under that agreement for that set duration of time. And correspondingly, what the landlord gets is certainty that they will receive rent for that same period of time. Um, so yeah, the main point I wanted to get at here is everything that you have to do under your rental agreement, all the rights that you have, but all the, also all the duties that you have responsibility for also correspond to kind of like the opposite side of those same rights and duties on the landlord side. And it's really on both parties to work together to fulfill that rental agreement to ensure that, you know, everyone is in a good place. So back to Slido. On a scale of one to five, how important do you think it is or would have been um, to have your rental agreement reviewed by a lawyer before you sign it? And as we're talking about that, um, just looking at the chat, I can see Shana said, landlords are now called rental providers, which sounds a bit nicer. Um, that is true, but it is also harder to type. It just takes longer. <laughs> so as someone who has to type it every day, I'm very like, oh, why? Um, but yeah, that's right. So as of last year, when there's been a number of kind of uh, rental law changes, the official legal term for landlords are now rental providers. It does sound a little bit nicer, a little bit less feudal now that we're in a modern society. Um, and it also explicitly, you know, basically points out that they are providing like, you know, a rent, rental residence, like they are a pro providing a service in a sense. Um, so it's really interesting to see the change in that terminology. And then on the other hand, tenants are now also officially called renters, um, which makes more sense. We're renting, therefore we are renters. So um, very interesting to see the results as they change. So we're kind of sitting in the middle. And I think that speaks to, you know, a lot of, I'm going to move on now, in the middle slash to the higher end. I think we're in a society at the moment where a lot of rental agreements are pretty kind of standard. Um, but at the same time, sometimes, you know, 
they do sneak like interesting terms in there that shouldn't be there. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. And just really quickly, if you guys can do a quick ranking exercise, just pull um, which of the documents on your screen that you might be on, which of the documents do you think are most important at the start of tenancy, starting from one to seven? This one might take a little bit of time as it comes through. So we've got photos of the property, second rental agreement, third conditions report. Oh, here we go, changing again. I maybe should have given you less documents to sort through over like a very short space of time. Learning for next time. <laughs> but for the people who've made submissions, excellent ranking, very good. Okay, so I can see so far building rules and rental reference letters are ranking last. Good job, guys. They are, in fact, the wild cards I put in there just to confuse everyone. Um, but at the top, we've got conditions report, rental agreement, photos of the property, and the bond lodgement receipt, which is great. I'm going to move on. So yeah, I've chosen the three main most important ones that I've decided are the most important. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about them quickly. So we've got the rental agreement, the RTBA emails, and the condition reports. And the reason I've listed them out specifically is they actually align with what we want to talk about today um, in terms of the main rental rights that you want to protect. So starting with rental agreement, which I think is definitely the most important document in relation to your residential tenancy. Um, and I think that should come as no surprise to anybody. Um, I've got a list here of what your agreement should have. So firstly, it does need to be in a prescribed form. I'm not going to go into exactly what that prescribed form is because it's a little bit nerdy. Also, there's standard form contracts out there. It's also on a CAFS website, but it does need to be in a prescribed form. You need to say what your rent is, the amount of your bond, how the rent and bond is to be paid, the length of the agreement, and any special conditions. So just a quick note about the length of the agreement, because this is something that often comes up as confusion when we're working with our clients. A lot of people, when we ask them, what agreement do you have? They say, oh, I don't have one. I'm on a periodic lease. A periodic lease is still an agreement. And often it rolls off the written agreement you had in relation to a fixed term. So um, it's really important for you to know that actually there is still an agreement that applies. And so under that agreement, there are still rights that you have, as well as duties that you have. Um, as it is on the corresponding side on the landlord side. Um, I also wanted to give some examples of what special terms and conditions are. So it might relate if you have a pet in a property that would explicitly need to be listed as a special condition that they have a right to reside there in the agreement. And it can also include like a breakdown of responsibility for maintaining gardens, just to make that really, really clear about who's responsible for what or particular rules about how the property is to be maintained. And that usually comes through in um, residential agreements about, you know, heritage listed buildings or something like that. Um, on the other side, there's also a lot of things that are called prohibited terms. So what your agreement definitely shouldn't have. I'm going to pause for a moment and I'm not going to read through all those dot points right now. They're not even exhaustive. There's a number of prohibited terms. Um, but on the right side, what I've done is I've included a QR code um, for the full list of prohibited terms that is on the Consumer Affairs of Victoria's website. Feel free to scan it. I'll give you a moment to do so. Um, you can scan it and keep it for safekeeping, um, or you can always just Google it. It's going to come back later, so I'm going to move on and talk about what happens if your agreement doesn't actually have all the um, terms that it's supposed to have or is not in a prescribed form, does that mean you can just be like, cool, I can just live here and do whatever I want? Um, the answer is absolutely not. Your agreement is still very, very much enforceable. All it means is that there may be penalty involved for the rental or provider or agent if CAF becomes aware of it. Um, and basically what that means is CAF can issue a fine. Um, this is, again, 
um, a huge point of confusion for a lot of people because when something goes wrong, you might like kind of do a bunch of research, you might find a residential tenancies act and you can say, hey, this is prohibited and there's a penalty unit. Great. I'm going to sue the rental provider for the penalty unit. Um, but that's actually not how the penalty units work. The penalty units just relates to how much cab can find the rental provider. So you can think about it as uh, the government uh, punishing the rental provider, but it doesn't relate to you being able to lean on it to kind of enforce your rights against the rental provider. So if you do look at your contract and there's something in it that, you know, there's nothing in it that should be in relation to what I've listed on the left, what you can do is just firstly speak to the agent, rental provider, make them aware, hey, this should be in a contract, it isn't. Can I get some clarification about what is going on? Um, if you really can't get any headways, still keep trying to perform the contract um, as far as you can, because you certainly don't want to be the one breaching the contract or being accused of breaching the contract. Um, if you're very concerned, you can always speak to CAV. Um, they might ask you to make a complaint and that might eventuate in a fine to the rental provider, but you don't really get to control that. Um, and I also say, like, don't put too much attention into that particular pathway because ultimately it won't actually lead to you getting what you want. It just might lead to the other side getting fined. Um, and the other side getting fined might mean that they get angrier and then they just act meaner. So ultimately it puts you in a worse off position when they're in a higher position of power. Um, so if you do decide to speak to CAF or you want to make a complaint, that's fine. You've actually got plenty of time to do so. But if you think doing that at that particular period of time is actually going to make your immediate situation worse, I would say hold off on that um, and try and find another way to assert your rights through like kind of like um, VCAT or, you know, speak to a lawyer, understand what your kind of options are and try to focus on that pathway instead. Now, we're also going to talk about on the flip side, what to do if your agreement contains the things that it shouldn't, so the prohibited terms. So again, your agreement as a whole is still enforceable. You still have to keep trying to do um, what your duties are under the agreement. All that means is under the Residential Tenancies Act, it does say that those specific prohibited terms, even if they are included in the contract, um, that those specific terms are unenforceable. Um, and again, there may be penalty slash fine involved for the rental provider or slash agent if CAF becomes aware of it. Again, what you could do is try and seek a clarification, have it in written form that you kind of like object to it if you want to. Um, you can make a complaint to CAF if you want, but again, think about whether or not it's actually going to make your immediate situation better. So for example, if it's a prohibited term about um, if something happens, uh, the rental provider may, might make you pay for their excess. You can say, hey, I object to this term and then just leave it. So there's like a documented proof that you say you are aware that it's a prohibited term, but then just don't spend too much time kind of focusing on that. For all you know, if you stay in that property for a year and nothing goes wrong, they may never even ask you or try to enforce that term. So it's a fight that you just don't really need to deal with until it comes up. Oh, I'm just going to have a look. So Lucy said, we have a question. Does a rental provider have to provide a digital copy of the signed rental agreement when requested? Well, they do have to provide a um, copy of the rental agreement. That's definitely for sure. And I don't see, I would assume that they would have better access to a digital copy than sending you a copy. Um, so if they are explicitly refusing to send you a digital copy, I will be very confused about that. Um, we can look into a little bit further um, to see whether or not there's any delineation between digital and hard copy within the Act, um, but they definitely should provide you with a signed copy um, on both sides um, after it's been signed by both parties. I'm going to move on. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to basically ignore all the questions until 6.20, Lucy. But I appreciate you maybe like giving me like a nice summary of which questions are coming through the most if we get time for question time. Um, so we're going to go into the second RTBA email. Sorry, second document that I think is really important, which is the RTBA emails. So I'm sure a lot of you have received these emails over the past. Um, RTBA over the last year have actually just done a lot of changes to their system. So whereas in the past, some of 
your lodgements with RTBA would have been, you know, physical, you might have received mail, etc. Now they're a lot more reliant on emails, um, and specifically interaction with renters and landlords and agents through the RTBA portal. So what happens with bonds when you're entering into a tenancy is obviously before the tenancy date starts. Um, but after you sign a contract, you have to pay the bond. And then after that, um, you have to confirm your details with the RTBA. Um, what, the way that that will happen is within 10 business days after you've paid the money to the agent or rental provider, you should receive a text as well as an email from the RTBA. That email will include a link to their portal. And once you click on it, it will ask you to verify your identity, agree to their terms of use, and ask you to confirm your details with them. Um, when you do this, make sure you check really, really carefully because once you press approve, it'll go, cool, finalize, that is the details that is lodged against your bond. Um, if you do accidentally approve any incorrect details, like slight typos in your names or something like that, it can actually delay your bond being processed later. Um, and I've actually encountered that in the past where the rental provider wrote my last name in my first name and the first name in the last name. And that was very annoying to deal with because I had to call the RTBA, but back then they weren't even an automated system. So that was a person I could speak to, right? But now it's an automated system. So it can actually create a really big delay later on, even if there's no dispute. So make sure you check carefully. And after you press approve, you will receive a bond lodgement receipt in your email. So why is this bond lodgement receipt, which is just one email amongst all the documents being sent to you when you're starting a tenancy, why is it so important? Well, firstly, it confirms that your bond has been actually lodged to the RTBA. And that's good because the RTBA is a lot more trustworthy to keep your money than maybe the rental provider or the agent. Um, what that means when that money is there is no one can touch it until the tenancy ends. And if anyone tries to make a claim for it, you'll automatically be notified and have an opportunity to be like, hey, what's going on here? Um, so it's a lot safer. What you do with that bond lodgement receipt, once you see it, keep it, file it in your rental folder. And when I say rental folder, I mean like in your email, make a folder. Anything you get in relation to your rental stuff, put it in there. It just saves you so much grief. Later on, if something does happen, everything is in the same place. And lastly, what do you do if you actually don't get any of those notifications after you've lost your um, bond or sent paid your bond to the rental provider or agent? Um, you definitely should follow up with the agent or rental provider. It's stipulated by law that they have to lodge that amount with the RTBA. If they don't, again, penalties apply. Um, so you should definitely follow with them up first. If they are unresponsive, you should call the RTBA and they will let you know what you can do next. So lastly, we're going to talk about the conditions report. And that was one that a lot of people kind of listed as really important together with photos of the property. I would assume that maybe because some of the frustrating experiences we've seen um, coming up in the word cloud related to repairs issues. Um, so again, more questions. On a scale of one to five, how is this your experience completing your conditions report? And the reason we're asking this question is because I wanted to get a sense of kind of like, yeah, did people struggle with it or like not? I think for some people, especially if they're renting for the very first time, they're so excited to get into a new property that they just like, yeah, everything looks vaguely fine. I don't really want to cause a big deal about this random scratch on the wall that the agent didn't pick up, I'll just say like, yeah, yeah, everything is fine. I'm so scared about like writing anything else. They sign it and they give it back, right? Um, so that was certainly my experience when I started renting and I was really, really young. Um, but over time, and as I became a lawyer, I became super, like a lot more pedantic and also a lot more distrustful of other people. So now I'm one of those people, I'm like, you know, one inch scratch there, one inch scratch here, like, you know, put everything in. Um, but yeah, we can see, in what we're seeing, most people didn't really enjoy their experience completing their conditions report. And it is a little bit of a bummer, <laughs> um, especially if you're moving into a property where there's already a lot of things that the rental provider might have put on there, or they may have not put anything on there and they should have, and then you have to go and find everything for them. Um, really interested to figure out what did everyone find frustrating about completing your conditions report? So in this one, you can just kind of 
there's no word limit, but I will move on pretty quickly in the interest of time. So if you give me a long answer, we may not be able to let you finish it. Um, so just like, yeah, brief ones will be good. Hi, Zoe. Um, while yep. we're waiting for responses to come in, we just had a pretty important question, which was, what is a condition report? Cool. Well, we're actually going to go into that in a moment. Um, so bear with me. Yeah. So, I mean, like drawing some of these links together, it can definitely be a lot more time consuming if you have to go and check and correct everything the rental provider didn't put in, because then you're really going to have to go through the property with a fine tooth comb, because now you're already starting your, um, you know, agreement thinking, God, I can't really trust this agent, can I? Um, yeah, so some of like a lot of similar themes coming through. Uh, let's move to, oh, there's one more question. But I think I might move on in the interest of time. I feel like I've like taken so much from you. Um, I'll give you <laughs> more time back, more information back. Um, so what a condition report is, it is something that you should get before you move in. So after you sign a contract and before you move into the property, in the bundle of documents that you get from the rental provider or agent, you should find kind of uh, two copies of the same document called a conditions report. So on it, it will show you the rental provider's name, the renter's name, the property, of course, and then line by line, broken up by rooms, everything in there. So it'll be like bedroom one, windows, doors, walls, wardrobe, mirror. And against each of those line items, the agent should go through the property and note any existing defects in the property as of the dates that you move in. So that's what you should get. And then at the very end of the conditions report, it should also have a number of photos. Um, so specifically in relation to, you know, any major defects in the property, if the agent is saying that there is like a major defect in relation to that particular wall, um, the photos contained at the end of the conditions report really should kind of serve as evidence of that. Um, so that's what a conditions report is. And the two copies that you will get will include all of that information. And then there'll also be a column on the right for each of those line items that is for the renter to fill out. So that brings us to what you should do once you move in. So once you move in, you should grab this document and go through it line by line and really check the property, go through in detail. And anything that the agent didn't pick up, you should explicitly write in there. Um, we've definitely had clients before who really felt uncomfortable writing things in there because they felt like they were already signing a dispute, but you're completely entitled to, you know, put in the conditions report what you are observing. Like that is literally your right. And it's really important that you do that. Um, to protect yourself. Um, for anything that is like, you know, a major defect that's already in a property or even any kind of like thing that you're putting in a line item about random scratches and things, if you think that it's not reflected in the photos that are already kind of attached to the report, you should also take your own photos. And then within five business days after you move in, give that completed report back to the rental provider and agent. If they have a problem with it or anything like that, they do need to kind of let you know to say like they disagree and then you kind of come back and go, well, look, here it is um, very soon at the start of the, uh, the tenancy starting. Um, but if you go through all these steps, what you have done is you have now compiled a key piece of evidence that will serve as like a crystal clear point in time evidence of what the state of a property was like when you moved in. Um, and what that does is it protects your rights as you're going through the tenancy as well as at the end of the tenancy. Um, what you should do, like I said, take the time to really fill out the, agree the conditions report as far as you can. Um, and you're entitled to list everything you see that you think is an issue. Um, and again, keep your conditions report, file it somewhere safe, make sure you can refer to it later. Don't lose it. Um, and again, if you don't get a conditions report, that's an issue. You should follow up with the agent rental provider. Penalties apply if they don't give you a conditions report. But what you really want to focus on is even if they don't give you a conditions report, go ahead and make one anyway. So what that means is if we go back to the same kind of journey before you move in, they didn't give you one, but you can actually go and make your own one. And if you scan that QR code, it will actually take you directly to a template conditions report on CAF's website. You can Google that in the future if you need to. Um, and basically just complete your side of it. And then again, within five business days after you move in, 
give your completed and signed copy to the rental provider and give them an option or give them a notice that they should reply to it if they disagree. And if they don't reply within like a set number of days, well, there you go. You've still been able to compile that key piece of evidence about the states of the property when you moved in. So I'm just gonna go to chat for a moment. Yes, Amanda, great idea. Ensure all your photos are dated. What I actually do is I just take photos on my iPhone and put in a folder. And in the past, when I've had like issues at the end of a tenancy with Bond and they're like, well, you never sent us any of the photos or the conditions report. It was actually sufficient for me just to screenshot um, the timestamp on my iPhone that was associated with the photos and send it through. Um, so, you know, having a smartphone these days is really, really useful. But if you are not using a smartphone, you're taking like, you know, um, other types of photographs that aren't like digitally timestamped, make sure you write on the back of them straight away. Um, the date that you sent um, that you took the photos so let's have a talk about what happens with repairs during a tenancy so what happens when something breaks so again i just wanted to lift this kind of infographic back that kind of depicts you know the rights and duties going back and forth um, and again if we drill down your rights and duties in relation to repairs and damage in a property while you're in a property is um, you are liable, like, so it is your duty to conduct minor maintenance. So these are things like light bulbs, um, you know, if your doorknob kind of falls off and you just need to nail back in and you feel like you can actually take on this task, it's probably not worth telling your rental provider, you can just fix it. Um, clean the property regularly. Um, and for any issues that you can't fix yourself or you really need help fixing, you do need to notify the rental provider. Um, so you shouldn't be afraid to tell them. And in fact, if you don't tell them that there are specific issues that are emerging while you're in the um, tenancy, um, they might actually view that as a breach, your breach um, of the contract. And the reason for that is because the landlord needs to ensure that while they're giving you privacy, which should mean that they are not coming to your property every day to inspect, while they're giving you privacy, they are reliant on you to make them aware of any issues that are arising in the property. And when they are doing their regular inspections, they should also be looking out for any signs of this repair that they should get on top of. When they do notice those signs of repairs or are made, of, made aware of those issues, they actually have a duty to fix it, um, to ensure that the property remains in good repairs. Um, so it's also their duty to liaise with you to gain reasonable access. And what I mean by that is access that you know, gives you proper notice and also protects your right to privacy so you know when they're coming and why and for how long. Um, but where they are asking for that reasonable access, they should be able to come in and do the repairs needed to ensure that the property remains in good repairs during the course of your agree um, your tenancy and beyond. And hopefully what you get at the end of that is a well-maintained property in good repairs. Um, a key point of confusion that comes up sometimes is, you know, like, if you're using something and it just breaks, but it's really old, like is that damage that the renter is liable for or is that something you're in relation to good repairs? So I've done a quick little graph here. Like, so did you break it? Well, yes. And that includes like intentional breaking or accidental breaking. So for example, if you grab a hammer and just start smashing a wall, you're liable for that damage. But if you kind of trip and fell into the wall, um, you might also be liable for that damage because you know it also includes accidental damage. Like that doesn't relate to fair wear and tear over time. Um, so in that situation, if you can fix it, but only if you can fix it according to the skill set that you have. Um, and if you can't, you still have a duty to notify the rental provider. In, and in that specific scenario, um, they might fix it at their cost, um, or they might say, actually, can you fix it because you caused it? Or they might say, let's split the cost because maybe that item was you know, a bit you know, old anyway. Um, but then you broke it, like, you know, it really depends on how reasonable the agent or rental provider is. But on the other hand, um, did you break it? No, it just kind of broke over time. You're like sitting over here and it just kind of crumbles for no reason. Um, all you've done is just like reasonably use it by like being around a property. Um, or um, yeah, if it's like kind of a fair wear and tear damage, then uh, the it's not really on you to fix it. So what I wanted to do was give you a case example because I want to understand how you guys would go about kind of navigating 
this problem. What would you do if you were had lived in a property for 1.5 years? Um, the toilet's always been like a little bit iffy. You fix it here and there where you can. And the you know rental provider is like kind of like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, maybe I'll come fix it, or maybe I'm just unresponsive. Um, so you fixed it a couple of times, which just obviously is not in good working order. Um, and as of last night, your toilet's blocked again. What would you do? So just choose one option and I'll give you guys about 20 seconds while I go through the chat. Cool. And I've also gotten some great questions in a chat that I can go through in a moment. Yeah, I'm not going to ask that question. I might read that one at the end. That's a long one. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm very pleased to see that no one chose option A, um, but we'll have a chat about option B and C. I'm going to move on now. So option A, main reason I'm really happy that no one chose option A is because it's the worst option. Oops. And the reason why I made it all orange and not red because red is like really alarming. Orange is slightly alarming. Um, basically, you haven't done like the basic thing of telling the agent that something is even wrong. Um, you haven't told them what their duty is and be like, can you fix it? And thirdly, and most importantly, you're breaching your own duties under the agreement. And this could actually lead to the other side coming after you and potentially evicting you. So not only are you not getting what you need done, you're actually also really exposing yourself to a lot of risk. I think you all know that because no one chose it. Great. Um, I actually think option B is not the best option either. Um, and the reason for that is, well, there are two happy faces. So you have attempted to communicate, you've tried to make them aware of the issue, you're trying to make them kind of like hold them account to their duty. Um, and, you know, more importantly, you're not breaching your own duties under the agreement. Um, there's nothing stopping you from, you know, liaising with the agent. But the main problem here is you're not actually starting to document written proof that you have kind of being aware that there is an issue, that they uh, have a duty to fix it, and that if they don't fix it, they're actually breaching their duty under the agreement. And not having that clear documentation kind of in a written form down actually stops you from taking any next steps that are available to you under the law. So the best option is actually to just write one simple formal letter to the agent that covers those points you're not breaching your own duties on the agreement. You're quite entitled to do this. Um, you're making it really clear to them what your position is and what you want them to do in order to fix it. And there's a clear documentary written proof that you can now then use to crystallize what you have done at that particular point in time and then assess your options going forward, whether or not that relates to going to VCAT or trying to go down like you know, a lease break route or anything like that. So in terms of understanding a kind of journey map of what that process looks like, if you were to take option C, um, ultimately um, the best way to get something fixed is often calling the rental provider first. You might have a really nice rental provider agent who is responsive. So this is the friendliest, simplest, quickest way to get something fixed if that's the case. Um, and you know, it's not very nice to like be like, la la la, I'm doing the right thing and all of a sudden receive a formal notice, right? So go ahead and do that. But don't get stuck there for too long if the agent's just kind of like unresponsive or, you know, oh yeah, 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 I'll fix it, but maybe in two weeks. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll fix it, but maybe six months. Like, that's okay. You don't need to be stuck there with them. You're quite entitled to move on to issuing a formal notice if they're unresponsive or disagree with your claim. You're entitled to put your position forward to them in a formal way. So what a formal notice is, it should be written it should state exactly what you think the breach is. You should specifically ask them to comply with the agreement by fixing that breach and give them a particular due date. So the due date for repairs is two days for urgent repairs and 14 days for non-urgent repairs. So regardless of which one you take, it's still a relatively, relatively short space of time. And if they don't do things, if they don't take any steps within that period of time, then you can move on to decide whether or not you want to take the next steps that are available to you 
under the law. It starts you on a journey if you want to go on that journey. Um, you can always send it and decide not to take that journey later if you're like, I'm feeling a little bit scared for now, but at least you've gotten that process started. If your repairs do relate to non-urgent repairs, you can always apply to CAV to get a determination from one of their kind of inspectors about whether or not the issue is in fact a repair. Um, if it is, they will actually issue you a report and you can send that report to the agent slash rental provider to be like, look, this is what CAV said, like seriously fix it. And if they don't do that, or if your matter relates to an urgent repair, you can apply to VCAT, where it is a self-rep jurisdiction um, and the form is relatively easy to fill out, even if you're not able to find a lawyer to support you. Um, so what you can do when you apply to VCAT is you can ask them to make an order that the rental provider fixes the issue. And if the repair order is not complied with, permission to have your rent paid into the rent special account. So if we did have anyone who didn't want to pay rent or didn't want the rental provider to have any access to the rent, this would be the best option. It takes a little bit of time to get there, but this is the better option because then you're not breaching your duties under the agreement. And in relation to the question about whether or not the rental provider needs to get a qu properly qualified tradesperson to do works, um, if that is something that you're very concerned about, you can also explicitly ask VCAT to include in their order that the rental provider gets someone who is properly qualified. And the answer is yes, they absolutely do have to get a properly qualified tradesman to do the work. But the definition of what properly qualified tradesman means can differ depending on the severity of what the works are that need to be done. Cool. We are not doing very well on time <laughs> at all. <laughs> but um, since we only have eight minutes, I'm going to move on to bonds, but we can make these slides available after the um, webinar. And I'm going to let people like, if anyone strongly disagrees with that, they can pipe like no into the chat. I haven't seen anything come up. So we're going to go to bonds. So if we get to the end of the tenancy and you have an issue about bonds, I'm going to skip the questions about bonds um, and just jump straight to the explanation about what a bond is. Again, this is a huge point of confusion for a lot of people who come to us in our bond service. Um, they don't realize that the money actually belongs to you even though you're not holding it. So the reason why the bond is paid to the RTBA is so that there is a third party that is not you or the rental provider holding the money that no one is supposed to touch during the rental agreement um, for safekeeping. And the reason for that is because at the end of the tenancy, if the rental provider does need to lean on the bond amount to cover any damages or any losses they incurred because you breached agreement, then they can make the claim from that pool. But having that pool being held at the RTBA also protects you because if their claim sucks, they're not just taking the money and running with it. Like that amount of money is held at the RTBA until it's really clear who the money should go to. And if, the, if there is a dispute, then it's up to VCAP to decide. So at the end, you might get a little bit of it back. But ideally, what we want to see here is not so much a triangle, but actually like a bit of a cube. So here's the bond. They make no claim. You get all of it back. There are really common reasons that rental providers use to claim the bond. Um, so it's either cleaning, damage, lease breaks. These are the most common reasons, but they're certainly not all the reasons. Um, but if the rental provider wants to make a claim on a bond, they do have to state exactly which of the reasons they are leaning on within the act to make a claim. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what you can do for each of those things because we're going to share the slides with you and you're more than welcome to read it um, in your own time. But the key concepts are go back to the documents that you've kept or the written documents of any notice of breach. Um, you might have, for example, in relation to a damage claim, or if it relates to cleaning, you can go back to the conditions report that you sent, that you kept at the outset, that you filed somewhere safe. Look at that and decide whether or not the rental provider actually has a leg to stand on. And if they don't, there are multiple opportunities as the bond recovery process goes. There's multiple opportunities for you to try and negotiate with the landlord. 
So either at the outset before they apply to VCAT or even after they apply to VCAT, and until here, there's actually substantial delays. There's nothing stopping you from speaking to them and sending them letters to say, hey, I think your case is unreasonable or invalid for X, Y, Z reasons. And I want to give you an offer. Um, and some key tips on what that offer might look like is really come at them with evidence, do it once, don't dribble it in. Sometimes it's okay to kind of sit back and wait because if they're going to make a claim on your bond, it's already going to be a bit of a delay. Sit back, relax, get organized, put it in a brief document, be really clear about whether or not you think their reasons for the claiming the bond is valid or invalid. And if valid, whether or not the amount is reasonable and come at them with evidence. And then after that, you should give them a firm offer. So a common mistake that a lot of people do when they make an offer is they go, I'm happy to settle, but then put nothing on a table. Just actually give them like a clear sum. Like I give you $200, is that a yes or a no? And that offer is open for a set amount of time. You want to give them a deadline by which they need to decide because it can't be indefinite, but you also want to give them a longer period of time than like two hours or something like that. Um, but if you're able to kind of put, you know, $200 on a table, yes or no, if they say no, hopefully they can come back saying like, no, because X, Y, Z. And it kind of gives you a little bit more information about, you know, should you just give up on negotiating, negotiating altogether? Or is there actually room to move around that $200? And you can just keep going until you kind of come to a resolution and hopefully get the remainder of your bond back quicker and without having to wait for the VCA hearing at the end. So really rushed through the last <laughs> part of that. Um, how did we go with time? Got three minutes to spare. I don't think we'll have time for questions, but I think Lucy has compiled a good list of questions, including the very long one, which I have not read yet. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thank you so much to everyone for rushing with me through this hour. I hope everyone found it really um, informative and helpful. Um, it is definitely very much an overview of all the things um, that you might wanna be aware of under a rental agreement. Um, my very last thing that I wanted to talk about is that we always really love to hear from renters, actual renters in our user workshops as we design our services, as we expand our services, et cetera. Um, when we do run these user workshops, we try to make it um, remunerated wherever possible. Um, so, as I'm finishing up, if anyone would like to join our mailing list to be notified about user workshops in the future, please put your name and number in Slido. I've made it so that your answers don't come up. So don't worry, no one's going to see, um, you know, your name coming up. And as we're doing that, I just want to thank everyone again for coming to today's webinar. Really appreciate your interest. Um, and also thank you so much to Marco and the College of Law for supporting us and partnering with us for this event. Thank you very much, Zoe. There's not much further I can add aside from the fact that I love the interactivity. I love the questions. I am a renter myself, so it was good to see the types of questions that popped up. And I didn't want to type in the fact that I was like, wait a minute, I have to pay rent through an app that charges me an extra dollar every time I pay rent. And I remember you put something up there, but I'm like, it's an extra dollar. It's not big deal, but not worth fighting for. But it does make you think what is worth the fight and what isn't. But overall, I really enjoyed that experience. I have nothing else to add to anything other than the fact that if anyone is interested, definitely get in contact with Zoe and Lucy from Annika. The college has a great relationship with them. I'm uh, regularly speaking to them about other events we can do together. They are wonderful, attentive, lovely. And so um, I'm pretty sure that if you want them to get in touch with you, they will. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, everyone. Apologies that it's ending soon, but it has been video recorded. We will provide you um, with the copy through our discussions with Annika Legal. They'll make that available to you. Otherwise, take care, everyone. Have a great night. Lovely seeing you here. All the best. And thank you again, Zoe and Lucy. Really appreciate that we got a chance to partner with you. on. Thank you so much. See you later. Have a good night, everyone.